In this tutorial series, I'm going to be sculpting, texturing, and rendering this cheeseburger. I have a lot of food sculpting time lapses on my YouTube page, and a lot of artists have been asking me for a food modeling tutorial. I'm going to create this asset with a PBR workflow. The assembly and rendering of the final asset will be done in Maya and Blender. And even though the model will be geared towards film and advertising projects, I'm also going to assemble the final result in Unreal Engine 5 to see how the asset performs in a real-time environment. If by the end of this course, I have met the eligibility requirements for the membership feature on YouTube, I will make this 3D model available to all members. This is something I plan to do for this channel. Depending on your membership level, you will be able to gain access to finished 3D models or completely rigged characters. The photo you are looking at was taken by Aleaf Aceron. You can find him on Unsplash.com. I've provided a link to his Unsplash page in the description of this video. I'm going to start in this lesson with a reference analysis, really delve into what we're looking at and process all the things that need to be done to complete this and make it look realistic. One of the most important things about this reference is how the cheese at the lower portion of the burger is completely liquidated because it's being subjected to more heat, right? It's sitting between two burgers. I'm assuming the cheese is placed on top of this bottom burger right after the burger came off the grill and then this other hot one was placed right on top of it and it completely liquidated the cheese here and then this one was this cheese was put on a little while after and this spicy sauce was placed on top of that so this cheese and this liquid sauce have retained their more solid shapes so that is one of the most important things about this reference you might be wondering how I'm going to create a 3D model of this burger when I only have one side of it. To solve that problem, I'm going to be using a secondary source of reference to help me resolve the other side. One of the things I like about these two pieces of reference is that they appear to have been taken with a narrower lens or have a narrower field of view so there is less perspective and that means that the information on the sides is more closer to the front or more exposed and therefore it gives me enough information to figure out the sculpting data for the sides. Let me see if I can get a pen in here to show you. I can divide these into two quadrants each about like that and all the information here would be on what I would be calling the front plane and the, all the information here would be what is on the side plane. So I truly have enough information to create a full 3D object. This appears to also be, uh, has, has less perspective. So all the information needed, uh, these two images can provide. Now for this second reference source, this highlighted area in blue is the ideal selection, primarily because our main reference only has two patties and therefore I only need two patties from this reference. And this bottom half is almost a perfect match, almost. There is yet another good thing I like about this piece of reference, and it is how interesting this uppermost bun looks. I feel like this would be really challenging to accomplish. And also from a detailed perspective and a visual perspective, this is really interesting. The way there's like a cavernous dig here and the cheese is flowing through it. Now the cheese is still a little bit too liquidated, but I really like this idea, so I'm going to consider using that as my uppermost layer. So when it comes to this reference, I'm pretty sure I will not be needing the middle one. I don't want that one because I like the top one a lot better. So eliminating it and shifting the uppermost layer down gives me something that I can start with for the other side. Yet again, I like to mention that this cheese is a little bit melted, so I would have to do some invention here to better match the cheese on the top layer here with the cheese of our main reference, which is not as melted. Another thing I have to pay attention to is the angle of the bun on our main reference. 
it's angled up so we can see underneath the top button, which means that if this is going to act as the backside, it cannot also be angled up. So I'd have to consider a deep angle. I have to be looking at the top of the bun from the back. So that means I have to angle down the bun in this reference and also the patty. So the patty would be angled down and that would be ideal because I'm picking this patty because of how interesting it looks. I want to be able to see this detail. So it definitely has to be rotated down uh, along with the bun on top of it. But as I rummaged through all the reference I'd collected a few days ago, I found this secondary piece of reference and I felt like this reference is giving me the correct angle that the bun should be at. And it's also, so even though I've chosen for this to be the backside, I want to use this third reference to help me gauge the angle. And it also appears to have the cheese not as liquidated, but still liquidated enough that it's sort of pouring down, but it's not as liquidated as this one where it's streaming down and going underneath the burger. This one is apparently is still holding its form. And so it's closer to what I would want. So this is going to act as a third supporting reference. So I'll have my main reference. I have the second one. One of the reasons why I'm picking it is because it has this interesting patty. And then I'm going to use this third reference to help me get the angle that I want for the backside. So it's going to be a supporting reference. Another great thing about this second reference is that it has ketchup, which could be replaced by the heavy spicy sauce that we see on our main reference. So our main reference has this really spicy sauce on the lower bun. And this second reference has ketchup instead over there. So I can replace the ketchup with the spicy sauce. So this is really good for the bottom side. And this is going to work really well for the top bun and the cheese and spicy sauce at the top. But the more I looked at it, I realized how horrible this looks from a, a, a design perspective. It, it just doesn't look nice at all. It doesn't have an aesthetically appealing look. This, however, has a really nice bun detail, really nice collapse detail. That would be really good to sculpt. And it's pretty much in line with what's happening in our main reference. It also has this same collapsing detail. So I think it'd be a really good match. The only difference is that this doesn't have as much sauce on the lower bun, but that's easy to replicate. I can just look at this first reference and let it help me develop some spicy sauce for this bun. Now, when it comes to this third reference, I do notice, however, that it feels like it has a what would be a wider field of view, and it looks like it has a lot of perspective. So this side plane has detail that is definitely receding from the camera and it's it's not as prominent as the side detail on the second and first. I think the first two references give me enough information that I can figure out how to deal with the burger. But it was just important to mention that I feel like this one has more perspective. It's just something to keep in mind. One of the things that makes this reference look aesthetically appealing is what's going on with detail contrast. It's really nice how there's so much detail over here with the patties and all the granular detail here or the high frequency detail here is housed by this more simpler top bun and the simple ground. Like it makes it very clear that this is the focal point. So it's very important that when I'm creating the other side that I also try to further that effect. I really think compared with all the other reference, that's what makes this one successful from a design perspective. With the last couple of food models that I created, I started to understand how important it is to weld different ingredients for cohesion. So the things that are invading each other's space or have almost become one unified piece need to be welded, but not at the very beginning. At some point in the sculpting process, they have to be merged into one geometry and detailed as one mass. So one of the first things that's definitely going to end up being welded as one piece are these four ingredients at the bottom, the lower cheese, patty, the spicy sauce, and the bun. This is really gonna help for areas like this where it's almost glued to each other. It'll look really nice. I might change my mind and just have the lower bun and the spicy sauce as one mesh 
and the lower patty and lower cheese definitely are going to be one mesh but at the moment i'm considering welding all four together the next thing that's definitely also going to be welded together to help sell it is this sauce at the top and the cheese right underneath it and another thing that's going to be welded together is the pickle and the sauce that's on it as you zoom in it's very noticeable how much fluid there is on this piece and it's one thing you absolutely have to capture to help this thing look real so the plan for that is to create a fluid mesh that's going to sit on top of most of these pieces if most of the ingredients at the bottom here become one piece that's going to be great to help sell the cohesion but that fluid mesh sitting on top is really going to help sell it the fluid is mostly comprised of juice from the meat and liquidated cheese cheese that has melted so much from heat that it's almost closer to its liquid state so that's definitely going to be an important piece that needs to be created to help make this thing look believable the fluid mesh one of the great things about using a pbr workflow is that you can truly count on a few detail maps a base color map a roughness map and at most a transmission map to really help sell the believability of the 3d model but i'll see if i need any more maps one thing I forgot to add on here that I will probably also have to paint is a subsurface map. So I'm looking forward to that. This is the first time I'm going to be coloring one of my food models in Substance Painter. So I'm looking forward to using a lot of Substance Painter's features to accomplish a more realistic result. And I'm also really happy that I get to see how all the maps are interacting in real time rather than paint in ZBrush and wait to export the maps to Maya to see what the final result looks like. One very important thing that I want to mention is the importance of capturing a successful silhouette. All the detail I'm seeing in the reference needs to be captured so well. And the way I like to think of it as if the final asset can survive without a displacement map, if it can still look realistic without a displacement map, then you've done a good job. That does mean, however, that you might end up needing a lot more geometry, but this is a good thing because the more detail you have on the, on the surface of your mesh, the better the physically based environment that we're going to render it can produce realistic results, especially for reflections and all those highlights and stuff like that. If the surface is truly approximating the detail on the ingredients that we've seen in the past few references, then the shaders will just behave correctly and there'll be less of a need for so many maps. So one of the things I'm definitely looking forward to accomplishing is having a very successful silhouette or a high fidelity silhouette. The silhouette has to truly approximate the model in 3D space. The last thing I want to show is three additional reference images that I'm going to rely on to help me shade the cheese. These three have a lot of good surface detail and whilst I'm in Substance Painter, I'm going to try to use these three to help me get some good results for the cheese. Even in the main reference, if you really zoom in close, you'll see pieces of charred meat and in some instances, droplets of another sauce or probably liquidated meat and they're just staining the cheese. So I want to make sure I try to capture some of that and just don't end up painting this thing yellow because that might really make it look flat and these are a lot more detailed. So is that the main reference is a lot more detailed. You can see a lot more of the either what is liquidated meat or a different sauce staining the cheese. So that's something I really want to try to capture. I more than likely will have to paint it into the base color map. But these three images are going to help with that. Last thing I want to talk about that you're also going to see me do is this charred meat here that's sprinkled everywhere. I'm also going to try to accomplish that. All right, so that's it. I just wanted to give you a glimpse of the kind of work I do in the back end before I start actually sculpting the stuff. If you just dive in and try to do what you're seeing, you will less than likely get great results. You really have to study it for a while and do some good planning. Sometimes it takes really long uh, and sometimes it's just, it's just a short process. It's not just about jumping into ZBrush and just doodling around or just dragging things all over the place to see what works. So in the next lesson, I'm going to start setting up the scene for Maya and ZBrush. In Maya, I'm going to be setting up the HDRI lighting that's going to illuminate this 3D model. And I'm also going to be ensuring that I have real world scale in Maya 
before I start working in ZBrush. So I'll be exporting some elements in Maya to help me stay within the correct scale for this model. So I'll see you in the next lesson where I start setting up my scenes in Maya and ZBrush.